Hi, Zon Wilder, PhD student in statistics at Oxford, based at the Big Data Institute. And today I'm going to talk to you about TSKit and how you can use it to process large-scale genomic data. So soon the largest data sets we work with will be in the millions of samples. Now, data on that scale is going to stretch the capacity of data structures we use to store genomic data, as well as the tools that we use to process data. So our answer to this emerging challenge are the tree sequence data structure and TSKit. TSKit is a comprehensive suite of tools to work uh, with tree sequences. To, we can very quickly calculate uh, population genetic statistics of interest from tree sequences. Um, MS Prime is a coalescence simulator, uh, and SLIM is a forest time simulator, both of which generate tree sequences. And finally, we have TS Infer, um, from which we can uh, very quickly uh, infer tree sequences for potentially millions of samples. So during the primer, I'll go into depth on what a tree sequence is. Uh, we'll get hands-on with the API for three of those tools. We'll see how they work, um, how they're very quick, and how they can be used to answer all sorts of interesting questions. So first, let's talk about tree sequences. And let's start with something that uh, should be familiar to everybody. Let's say that we have a population of interest and we want to sample some genetic material from it. So we pick three people, we sample three people from this population, We'll call them A, B, and C. And let's make an assumption. Uh, people are diploid, and let's say that the material we get here, we can phase. So we know which allele belongs to which uh, chromosome. So for one individual, individual A, we have a maternal and paternal chromosome, same for B and C. So we have three individuals with six chromosomes. And we'll see why that's an essential part of a tree sequence um, throughout the primer. So now we have our six chromosomes on the left here. In the right, we have 50 base pairs of material. And let's say this is a very small chromosome, just 50 base pairs. Uh, so rows are the individuals, columns are the um, sequence, or each base pair. And if we look at this, we see that most columns are invariant. All the individuals have a T, an A, so on and so forth. So we just want to look at the four variant sites in this data. Um, and we can throw away the invariant sites. We don't need them. Um, and we look at these sites and we say, all right, Let's make another assumption. If the first assumption is that we can phase the material that we've sampled, the second is that we know ancestral and derived alleles. So we know which um, allele happened first and which one's the result of a mutation in the history of the sample. Um, let's also say that they're biallelic, so there's just one ancestral and one derived allele. So if we can make those assumptions, we can recode this with ones and zeros. So zeros are ancestral alleles and one are derived. Looking at this, um, might see something that looks a lot like a VCF. That's basically how VCFs encoded uh, samples by variance. So when we're looking at this pattern of variation, you might wonder what is the evolutionary or ancestral process that resulted in um, these six samples having the pattern of variation at these four sites? And when we say evolution or ancestry, one thing a lot of people think of are trees. Right, in evolutionary biology, they've been working with phylogenetic trees since the origin, since the beginning of the field. Um, in ancestry, people work with pedigrees or family trees. So let's just look at a pedigree of these three individuals. This might look like something you've seen before. We have circles that are female, um, squares that are male. And we're just showing the path back to common ancestors. Um, so at the bottom, we have the present day three sampled individuals, and then going back in time to the common ancestor of the three individuals. And we see that. Looks like B and C are related about three generations back in time. Um, and then A is, uh, finds a common ancestor with the common ancestor of B and C a few generations after that. All right, so you may have seen something that looks like this before. But now let's just simplify this. And we only want to record the common ancestor events. So you can see how we flip between these. And really, we just are recording where they find a common ancestor. And now let's just fix a little bit of terminology that we'll use for the rest of the primer and the main talk when we talk about trees and tree sequences. First, uh, we call this, the genomes that we sampled sample nodes. And we'll call the ancestors internal nodes or ancestor, um, ancestral genomes. So nodes are genomes. Second, we have edges that connect nodes. Uh, sample edges are edges that connect a sample to an ancestor. And ancestral nodes connect an ancestor to an older ancestor. All right. So with that little bit of terminology and this understanding, 
Let's think again about the fact that we said that we have three individuals with six chromosomes. And if we look at any particular base pair, the pattern, uh, the ancestral pattern of that base pair will have to take into account all six chromosomes. So let's just look at a specific base pair and we'll find a gene tree rather than a pedigree. So that will be the tree showing how those, um, the six chromosomes at that base pair find each other back in time. So here's an example gene tree at, at some site. Um, and if you haven't thought about like chromosomes as individual lines of descent or gene trees before, you might be surprised that the chromosomes of each individual don't necessarily have a common ancestor before they have a common ancestor with another individual. So specifically what I'm talking about here is B2 and C1 have a common ancestor before B1 and B2 or C1 and C2. Now, if you think for a little bit, that's not surprising really at all because we showed in the pedigree that they're related um, as like second cousins or I think three generations back. Um, all right, so with this gene tree, let's think, well, how do we get onto this tangent? We want to know how do we reconcile the pattern of variation we see in our sample. So let's use the gene tree and let's go back to the sample data. So that's that same tree we were just looking at and here's our six chromosomes and four variant sites. So if we look at just the first site, we want to see, all right, how do we reconcile that with the tree? A1 has a derived allele, everything else has an ancestral allele. That's pretty easy. There just needs to be a derived allele on the lineage of A1 before it finds a common ancestor with A2. So we can just throw a mutation on there and you can see that this tree exactly shows the pattern at um, the first variant site. All right, how about the second variant site? B1, B2, C1, C2 have a derived allele, but the A1s don't. All right, also pretty easy. There was just a mutation on after the common ancestor of B and C, the four chromosomes there. And as a result, those four samples inherit the mutation. They have the derived allele there. Fine. Now we look at the third site and we say, all right, B1, B2, C1, there's no way to put that on the tree without a recurrent mutation or uh, multiple independent mutations. There's no way to put just one mutation on the tree to show B1, B2, C1 have it without also getting C2. So what does that mean? Um, so we can't represent that without that, um, you know, uh, doing little fiddly things. So recombination must have occurred. We'll go into depth on why recombination must have occurred, but for now, just take my word for it, there was a recombination event. So to show that there was a recombination event, um, we're gonna do something called a subtree prune and regraft. And that will show the, um, the uh, correlated nature of the, the trees across where that recombination must have occurred somewhere between base pair 10 and 30. And I should say, here we still have the sequence data labeled. So we'll copy the tree, we'll prune off the subtree that needs to be changed and regraft it to the tree, and then just do a little housekeeping, and we can plop a mutation down, and all of a sudden, mutation two is shown on that tree. So now we say that that first tree, that was fine for us for the first two mutations. We say this tree spans from zero to 15. There was a recombination event in the history of the sample at 15, and now we have this new tree that we just showed how we get that with the subtree prune and regraft, and that will keep going until there's another recombination event. So let's keep going, let's look at site three. We say the same thing, you can't show that on tree one. So we do another subtree prune and regraft. We cut the subtree leading to B2 from the tree. We regraft it on somewhere else, and we drop another mutation there. So the examples we just showed pruned a single lineage but it could be you know, at the root. It could prune um, half the tree from the root. And now we see that um, tree two explains the variation from base pair 30 onwards. Um, so as I said, you can think of that as the genomic span of the tree. How much, of, how much does a certain tree explain ancestry? Tree one for 15 base pairs, tree, uh, tree zero for 15 base pairs, tree one for the middle bit, tree two for the set, uh, last bit. So let's do away with the A1 notation and let's just label all the nodes with integers. So now we have um, zero to 12 for the sample nodes and ancestral nodes. And let's delve into a little bit about biologically, why are there multiple trees? What does that whole thing about recombination generating multiple trees really mean? 
Um, and the thing that I want you to keep in mind as we explain this is that you can think of chromosomes as mosaics of material inherited from multiple ancestors. Think about that concept as we, we go through these next slides here. So on top, we have the tree sequence again um, with the different spans. And on the bottom here, what we're showing are the edges. So we have a child node on the left. We have a span of edge, um, again, labeled 0 to 50. And we have the parent node of an edge here. So you can just trace 0 to 7. That, that edge exists in the first tree. All right, it spans the first tree. It's in the second tree, and it's in the third tree. So that edge exists for the whole tree sequence. Um, the first node, same thing. 1 to 7, first tree, 1 to 7, second tree, 1 to 7, third tree. Now when we get to node 2, we say, all right, the edge where, parent, where node 2 is a child exists in the first tree, but it goes to 11, fine. Second tree, it goes to 6. Here's a break point. 2 to 11 now goes to 2 to 6. And then in the third tree, it finds another um, parent node, an 8. All right, so they can have multiple edges over the tree sequence, and those correspond to the breakpoints in the trees. That's the subtree printed regraft. You can look at the other sample nodes. We see some of them span uh, sample edges, some of them span the whole genome, some of them don't. And now let's look at the ancestral edges. And here we see something interesting. Um, for the sample edges, they span the entire genome, but when you get to ancestors, they don't necessarily have edges over the whole genome. Right? So for 8, for instance, that only exists in the second tree. That ancestor only gave material to those for 2, 3, and 4 in that middle tree, but not in, this, and not in base pairs 0 to 15 or base pairs 30-something to 50. Same with a couple others. All right. So why is that the case? Let's think about recombination. So let's say this is the genome of ancestor 11. So we said ancestor 11 only existed in the first tree, but this person that lived in the past didn't have some sort of magically smaller genome, chromosome. They had the same um, 50 base pairs as everybody else. So here's their 50 base pairs. And let's say there's a combination event with um, the other chromosome that um, the individual with ancestor node 11 had. Remember, there's, um, since we're diploid, we're talking about chromosomes, not individuals. So. Um, when there's a recombination, you could end up with something like this, right? So you color the bits that you get from one chromosome versus the bits you get from another chromosome. Now, if that happens repeatedly, so that's what we just saw, and then somewhere later, we get another crossing over event with some other individual. Now we have down to sample node 2, which is what inherited from 11. Um, for this first chunk of base pair, about 0 to 15, they copy from 11. But then they copy from someone else for this next base, next bit of material. And then finally, at the end, they have a third ancestor. That's all spatial along the chromosome. So here's that edge representation again. Here's 2, sample node 2. And here are the edges that where 2 is a child. Parent is 11, parent is 6, parent is 8. That corresponds to the ancestral material that recombined there. Um, and then if we look at these breakpoints, we see they line up with the edge breakpoints. And we realize that the recombination breakpoints are the edge tree breakpoints. And an ancestor that lived way back in time, like 11, they get chopped up repeatedly with recombination. And by the time it reaches your sample, they might only give a little bit of material. All right, so that's the fundamental insight behind the idea that chromosomes are mosaics. Um, so now let's. Um, Go over to the, the API for uh, TS Infer and just see how we we actually work with these um, uh, how we can actually work with these tree sequences. So now that we have some idea what they are, uh, there's an extensive documentation at TS Kit Read the Docs, um, but we'll just get you a very brief intro of how it works. So I'll stop, start with the top level tree sequence class. What we have to do is import uh, TS Kit. We can load up a pre-made example, which is exactly the example we were just looking at. And with a tree sequence, first thing you want to do is probably say, OK, what does it look like? And we can just draw that exactly as we've been drawing on the board. Um, and to do that, we just have to use a dot trees function on that top level class. So we say for tree in our tree sequence example dot trees, let's display it and do some SVG magic, make sure it all fits on the board. And that should be exactly what we were just looking at. All right. Uh, TSKit makes it easy for us to understand some uh, sort of summary statistics about tree sequence as well. So 
how many trees are there? There are three in our example. That's right, we built three trees. Um, how many nodes are there? There are 13 edge, uh, edges, there are 18 mutations, four. That's for the whole tree sequence. But if we just want to say for each individual tree in the tree sequence, we go through and we say, all right, the first one has two, second one has one, and the third one has one. It's exactly what we just worked through. Um, so now let's talk about how it's all represented under the hood. So we go back to this representation here. On the top, we have the tree sequence. On the bottom, we have this edges uh, spatial representation we're working with. And I said earlier that we'll label all the nodes with integers. So if we do that, uh, you can say, OK, each mutation happens above a node. No reason we can't just put that in a table. If we take those off the tree, put them in a table, you can easily move between the two. Um, edges, too. There's only a little bit of information each edge is encoding. Uh, the child node, the parent node, the span. So why can't we just put those in a table, too? So we'll put each node has a child and parent. It has a genomic span. It's only valid for a certain bit. That's the, that's the period where the parent node gives material to the child node, as we just talked about. And let's take the nodes off the tree for good measure. And then all of a sudden, we have no more tree. We just have a bunch of tables. The sites one is just where mutation occurs. And you can satisfy yourself that we can go back to the tree, um, or we can just use the tables. So under the hood, everything's stored as tables, uh, because that's a much more efficient way to store things. Um, so now let's just see how we could work with tables and manipulate them. Um, So here we just say, here's our example again, the tables, the nodes, uh, and they're stored, ID of each node. Is it a sample or not is what flags refers to. We didn't talk about populations or individuals, but um, here's the time, the age of each node. You can access that easily. We can say, what are the edges? It's exactly what we just showed. Um, all it's encoding is the parent and child, and then a genomic span and left and right coordinates. Um, mutations, small little table of our for mutations. And the data itself is stored as NumPy arrays. So all you need to do is just pick out a specific column. And um, so you just want the times of each node, and you get the, like, this array of all the, the node times. If you want to work with a uh, C API instead of just Python, there's a um, well-documented C API uh, for all your uh, efficient needs. Here's a little bit for. Um, Right Fisher simulator, see that we're just uh, building up a table and um, querying it, see what parents are, and so on and so forth. So that's all well documented at the same link as before. So that's what a tree sequence is. That's a bit how to work with it. Let's go on to the second part here, where we'll talk about simulating tree sequences. And specifically, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about MS Prime. So I said there's a coalescent simulator, MS Prime, and a Ford's time simulator, SLIM. Um, with SLIM, you can do anything you want with selection or keeping track of samples or demographic events. Um, and, but today, we'll just focus on MS Prime. So MS Prime is a very efficient re-implementation of MS, which I'm sure a lot of people here have used. Uh, here's a link to the documentation. Here's a link to the citation. Um, and it's a coalescent simulator, so the trees you come up with are exponentially distributed in their lengths, just as under the coalescent. So here's an example of how it works with no recombination. All we have to do is msprime.simulate, six samples, human-like effective population size of 10,000. And since there's no recombination, and we just went into depth on why recombination means multiple trees, as expected, there's only one tree. No recombination, one tree can show as much material as you want. Um, and here's that first and only tree. Um, just as I said. And if you want to know the branch lengths, because it's a coalescent simulator, you can say above any node, here's the branch length, here's the total branch length in the tree. Um, coalescent theory has uh, uh, expectations for those values. Um, and then you can iterate over the tree in any, any order that you want. So for most people, most loci of interest or, or just your simulation needs, you can't really ignore recombination. If you have a large enough region, 
and enough samples, there's just bound to be recombination in the history of the sample. So rather than trying to work your way around recombination, why not just embrace it with MS prime? So all we have to do to incorporate recombination is fix the recombination rate. You can also use recombination map if you want to look at uh, human-like recombination hotspots. Um, so here, let's do a 10 kilobase region with a human-like recombination rate and a human-like effective population size. So up top, we have that same simulate. Now we only add the parameter recombination rate. And let's print out the resulting trees. You get these two trees here. The first one, six kilobases. Second one, four kilobases. Um, this just explains again what I said. You get multiple trees because you have recombination. And if you want to inc incorporate mutations, um, a really nice feature of coalescence simulation uh, with neutral mutations is that mutations don't affect the topology of what you simulate. So what we can do is just run a coalescence simulation and then just throw those on afterwards. And that leads to some massive speed ups when you don't have to keep track of all that data. So here we'll show an example of simulations where we put in a, a mutation rate. Uh, this is no recombination, so remember single tree. And we do the simulation, and essentially what happens is you just throw on the mutations afterwards. We'll see how that's really fast in a second. Um, so let's go hands-on to see why that's fast. So we're going to do a really big simulation here. Let's say that we want 100,000 10 megabase chromosomes. All right, so the same um, parameter or same parameter style that we were just working with, sample size, the length of the chromosomes, the recombination rate, and let's run it. And we will see that in four seconds we run that, and we generated 45,000 trees, uh, 373,000 edges. So we get this really big file. Let's see just how big it is. Uh, it's only 16 megabytes. It's not that huge. We, Do you mind the font size a bit? Sure, yeah, let's see. How's that? Okay. A little better? All right. Um, we can load it up in 21 milliseconds. Um, let's say you want to do some, calculate some statistic. You need to iterate over, over all the trees to do that, perhaps. So let's iterate all over all those, um, how many were there? 45,000 trees, 162 milliseconds, including doing something. Um, and now let's, as we said before, we'll just sprinkle on or throw on those mutations afterwards. So now we have a mutation rate that's two orders of magnitude higher than the human estimated mutation rate. Um, and we'll just, we're doing that afterwards because it doesn't affect the topology. And we see in 12 seconds that worked and we just created 4.8 million variants. Um, that's going to make the resulting output quite a lot larger. So now it's 193 megabytes instead of 16. But if you want to store this as you would store it with a VCF, as we talked about earlier, where it's variance times samples uh, with well, time complexity variance times samples, you have 450 gigabytes. So way more efficient to store it in a tree sequence than in a genotype matrix. Um, and let's say you want to do something like pairwise diversity. You can do that incredibly quickly. Remember, this is um, 4.8 million variants. You calculate the pairwise diversity there. All right. So now let's uh, reach the third part. We have some understanding of what a tree sequence is, what that means biologically. Uh, we've seen how we can simulate things very quickly. Um, now let's talk about um, third algorithm, TS infer which goes from the sequence data to the trees. Just uh, want to pause for a second. Are there any questions? That's it. Cool. All right. Um, so one component of inferring ancestry might be phylogenetic um, inference. And that's a really well-studied problem people have worked on for decades, well-defined at the species level. You can look and find your um, resolved phylogeny of all the great apes or any other species you're interested in. But a related but more difficult problem is coming up with the gene genealogy of a specific region. So if you remember the difference between something like a pedigree we showed earlier and the gene genealogy at a specific base pair, a specific locus. Um, but that's really important. 
there's plenty of reasons why you'd want to uh, infer the gene genealogy of a region. So to see why that's important, let's talk about this example uh, from GDF5. And here's um, uh, Capolini et al. is the, uh, the paper this is drawn from. So GDF5 um, is a gene that's really important, uh, it's, uh, highly associated with de decreased height and arthritis. I think the highest effect size of any height-related SNP is in GDF5, um, or one of the highest. And in this paper, they come up with this uh, enhancer region downstream, GROW1, uh, that has a novel growth enhancer that's really important. And specifically, they find this one variant, this common variant in GROW1, that is a target of positive selection, and they've shown um, decreases enhancer activity. So they want to understand what's the story with this variant. And when you look, you just look at the very, the, um, the allele frequencies around the world, you see this pattern where, okay, it looks like it's more common in Africa than out of Africa. Um, and there's really strong positive selection there. But that you know, tells you something, but doesn't tell you the full story. To know the full story, you really want a tree. Sir, which is the ancestral, which is the direct, which one decreases? Um, the derived allele decreases enhancer activity. And the ancestral one is the, the highly conserved across mammals um, keeps enha enhancer activity. So the derived one is more common outside of Africa. So what they did was they took the region of that downstream enhancer. They identify 150 kilobases. Um, they have their panel of individuals with and without, or just uh, genotyped at the allele. Um, that's 1,500 of those. They took out a couple hundred that seemed to be recombinant. And they identify ones that they thought didn't have major recombination in this region. And they come up with three clades. So there's a clade A that has all the ancestral alleles, and that includes um, uh, most populations in Africa and some outside of Africa. And then clade B has archaic individuals, so our few sequenced Neanderthals, the Denisovan, and almost all the non-African individuals. And then they have this B star, which is a particularly important sort of more um, uh, different haplotype background that also includes the derived allele. So here's ancestral, here's derived. And with this, they can say something about the origin of the allele. There's multiple different explanations for why you have that pattern of ancestral and derived, right? But it could be any of these. You could have had independent mutations in those archaic individuals and modern humans, right? That could happen. You could have introgression, that's something a lot of people are interested in. We'd have these long branches, um, and that would be pretty, uh, that would be a big signifier of an intergressed version of the derived allele. Or you could have standing variation in the common ancestor of all humans and these archaic individuals, and that just gets passed on to um, extant humans and the sequenced archaics. So, Again, like, what do you mean by intergression? So, intergression would be that this allele arose um, in the common ancestor of the archaic. Individuals, so the common ancestor of Neanderthals and Denisovans, some ancestor there had this mutation which caused this. And from there, it was when there was a little bit of interbreeding with um, humans that lived a long time ago and these archaic individuals, they passed this, this derived allele onto humans, some humans, and that's why humans have it. So it didn't happen in a human ancestor, it happened in an archaic ancestor, and then the rest of um, the individual, the, the modern individuals that have it got it from them, right? Versus um, it happened in the common ancestor. So this is really, like we were thinking earlier, where do we throw the mutation down on the tree? And they said, given what you see with the fact that Neanderthals um, have this version that some, some Africans actually have, it's more, more likely that this was a uh, standing variation in the common ancestor of all humans and archaic individuals. Um, and it's less likely that this was introgressed because there really isn't much evidence for introgression into, um, I think it was East Africans that also had the derived allele. So it's more likely that there's just a low level um, of it in Africans, but it was selected in out of Africans. So the point here is that that answered a biological question, or at least gave us some insight. And it's an intuitive and biologically accurate way of thinking about evolution. Evolution happens basically on trees like that. So if we know the tree, we can say something about what happened. Um, if we had the fully resolved gene genealogy, you could really do anything you want in population genetics. Because you can go back to the sequences, you can do anything you want with sequence data. But you also have the trees. 
So you could do direct inference of selection. You could say, all right, is a mutation causing more lineages? Is that causing this explosion in our tree at a certain region? Um, you can say, what are the origins of mutations? So that's the example we just showed. You could say something about demography. There's a lot of results in coalescent theory and about how demographic changes will affect these trees. So you can do a lot with a tree. But what are the limitations of trying to build one tree over a region? It basically goes back again to recombination. We said before that if there's recombination, there just are multiple trees. So that if you're trying to sort of coerce everything into one tree, you're throwing away um, information that recombination provides. And you're also not getting the correlated nature of ancestry because you're just focusing on a specific region. So the real answer is something like a tree sequence or an ancestral recombination graph, if you're familiar with that, to answer this question. So to see how TS infer tackles this problem, let's go back to the example we saw of the ancestral edges and sample edges, um, if you remember this structure. And now let's look at an analogous simulated version. So in the simulated version, we have the samples here. And they're, they're haplotypes instead of edges, but you can see how those are analogous in some way. And you can see ancestors going back in time. And as we said before, ancestors only give generally part of their genome to a sample. And the important thing to note here is not only that ancestors are only giving part, a chopped up bit of their genome to samples, but also as you go further back in time, you're getting less and less material. So if Alexander the Great was your ancestor, he's probably only going to give you a much smaller bit of genome than your mother. Well, that makes sense. Um, so this is an important result also because we know that the number of ancestors to a sample, if the sample size is n, is approximately log n. So not only are we working with small bits of material in the past, but also sort of a manageable number of ancestors compared to the sample size that you're working with. So from those insights, TS infer takes a two-step approach to inferring ancestry. The first step is if we knew what these ancestors were, that would help. So let's just try and guess what the ancestors are. We'll make a best guess of what all this ancestral material looks like based on the pattern of variation in the sample. And once we do that, we can have a copying process where we match ancestors against older ancestors. We said before that chromosomes are mosaics of ancestral material. So that means that ancestors are also mosaics of older ancestors. And then we can match samples against ancestors as well. Again, mosaics. All right, so two steps. Guess what the ancestors are, a very well-informed guess, and have a suitable copying process where we can match. So I won't go into the details of the first step. Uh, there are a lot of heuristics. They're all well-described in the preprint here. Um, and Jerome will talk more about Lee and Stevens' copying process um, in the main part of the talk. But for now, um, and before we get hands-on, I'll just mention as a side, uh, my main bit of work is using the output of TS infer, which are topologies, right? So they don't actually infer branch lengths. It's just a quirk of the way that we do it. And then saying, how do we work with a topology that's inferred and put branch lengths on it? Branch lengths are really important for answering any of those questions we talked about earlier. If you want to know anything about selection, you need to know branch lengths, demographic history. If you're doing infectious disease transmission patterns, um, branch lengths are important for a lot of those applications. So briefly, um, my approach is a little different than the state of the art. Uh, so the state of art is a, you can either do a maximum likelihood estimation by counting number of mutations on a branch and then using mutation clock. Standard Bayesian approach would be you have a coalescent prior um, that's exponential depending on number of lineages. You have uh, some idea of how many mutations should happen over a certain number of generations, how many recombinations should there be per generation, and then you can do um, MCMC or, or something like that. Now, this is just an aside. So the problem with that is that the coalescence is really hard to sample from uh, because it depends on the number of ancestors remaining at every given time. Um, so that's really difficult when you have loads of samples and loads of trees. So the more scalable version of this is to uh, do important sampling. So important sampling you have a distribution of interest, in our case, the coalescent likelihood of a tree. We can sample from something different, 
that looks a lot like our target distribution, and then you can reweight. So and then you just reweight samples, and then you have important sampling weights. So coalescence hard to sample from. Let's do something else that's easier to sample from. Something that's easier to sample from is called the conditional coalescent. And I'll just leave off there with the, the citation if you're interested in how that works. But um, that's sort of the focus of my work. Now back to uh, getting hands on with TS and FUR. Going back to the API here in the last uh, couple minutes. Um, this is, as I said before, the, the, the insight that we use is if we know ancestors, then we can do a copying process. So let's use, let's go back again to the small data set that we had before. There's examples online if you have a VCF of a bunch of samples you're interested in or a region you're interested in and you want to use TS Infer. Um, there's a, a very thorough tutorial there. But we'll just show a small version of it with the data that we are working with. So this is the same data from the beginning. We have four variant sites. We have six chromosomes. So um, each, uh, so there's a context manager to make this thing a sample data, which is what you need to then do TS infer. Uh, we add in each line a site. So remember there were four sites and six variants. So we add site zero. That had the pattern of your mutation. If you remember before, where just A1 had it. Um, those are the ancestral and derived alleles. So you can think of the zeros and ones as being an index into that third array. So you add the data from before to this sample data um, object, and then you just need one line to run TS infer. If you can coerce your data into that, all you need to do is this, and then you get the output. So we'll look at the output, and we'll see this is what TS infer tells us about that original minimal example. So it looks a little different. Um, and that's because we're fundamentally limited by the information that was in the example, so the mutations and recombinations. But you do get the main structures here. If you look at the samples that inherit from a mutation, it gets all that right. Uh, the top version has something called polytomies, where um, there aren't binary nodes. There's, you see, three lineages finding a common ancestor. Um, but you can see. Uh, what TS infer does with the limited, you know, very limited amount of data that we give it. Um, so, oftentimes, if you want to use TS infer on real data, you have all your samples from different populations, um, different individuals. Maybe you want to keep track of all of that. So, let's show how we can do that with our mini example. Let's say those three individuals we had: one came from Broad, one came from Harvard, one from MIT. So, we add populations for those. Um, then we add individuals that we tag to each population. So person A was from the Broad, person one was from Harvard, person two was from MIT. And then when we add the site data, it will keep track of which um, chromosomes in that middle array are from which individuals. And then after you do the inference, you can just easily recover the metadata, say what the populations are, say what the individuals are. The populations are 12012, Broad, Harvard, MIT, are three individuals from um, those three different populations. Uh, nodes array, which nodes are associated with those individuals? So you can go right from the output of TS infer to saying, all right, who's who in my data? Um, a side note, if you're interested in sort of um, creating synthetic ancestors for, interest, for instance, is that you can break up the steps. So we said it's a two-step algorithm. So you can do the first step by itself. You can generate your ancestors. And then you see that this is what the ancestors that TSFR comes up with. So um, each ancestor is based around a focal site. Um, and you can manipulate this if you want. And then you can do the second step, which is just the matching steps. So and at any step in here, you can step in and um, do whatever manipulations you want. It's, it's very flexible. And I'll finish here with an example from real data to see what a sample pipeline and output might look like. So in the preprint, we did this on um, 1,000 Genomes, Simon's Genome Diversity Project, and UK Biobank. And you can see all the, uh, the fact that the trees that are outputted contain meaningful biological um, signal. But here we'll just use a small example from malaria. So for this small example, uh, we use the Plasmodium vivax genome uh, variation project, one of the main species of malaria. Um, we had to fulfill those assumptions that we talked about earlier. They have to be phase data. 
So um, a colleague of ours phased the data. Uh, you also need those ancestral and derived alleles. That's another important assumption. So if we can phase it, we also need to do ancestral and derived. I did a multi-species alignment, just did a simple uh, maximum parsimony approach to say what's ancestral, what's derived. Sort of rough and ready, but enough to fulfill the assumptions and get running. So we've, I won't show any of the code that does all that because it's mostly just data wrangling. Um, but at the end, you get a samples file, just like the ones we built before. So we can load that up. You can take a look at it and say, what's our data set like? OK, it's pretty small, only 128 kilobytes file size. Um, there's the 15 populations, 124 individuals, a few thousand sites. Um, number of inference sites, TS Infer only works with non-singleton sites. Um, so we have to, there's a load of singletons, apparently, so we had to throw those out. Um, and then we can just do our one, one line of magic to do TS Infer on the sample data. And we come up with 1,400 trees. And let's take a look. So we look at the first one here, and it looks like a mess. There's a lot of polytomies. You can't see anything um, going on with the samples. So we'll use a tool that you might be familiar with to do a circular tree. This is a little better, but there's no way that you can say anything meaningful from this without knowing the metadata about the individuals. So as I said before, if you have metadata and you build that into your sample data file, you get that right at the end, which makes your analysis pipeline really easy. So um, all of that was stored in the sample data file, and it's transferred to the tree sequence after we do the one line ts.infer. So here's the populations. We know who's from Thailand, who's from West Cambodia, so on and so forth. We can use that information to redraw the, in the tree and color the tips by, um, by the country of origin. And that's what it looks like here. So now you have all the countries and labeled. That's a little better, but um, there's no way that you could really say anything meaningful just from that number of samples, let alone UK Biobank, where you have a million tips on a tree. It's how you visualize that is a really important question. Um, so instead, we're going to do um, something to summarize. We come up with a summary statistic from a tree sequence to look at top level signal from the data. And we call that genealogical nearest neighbors. So this is a metric we defined from a tree sequence to say something about how individuals are related to one another. So if you have k sets of reference nodes, uh, for instance, if you have the 15 populations, and you can say which nodes are from which population um, for the Vivac samples, the GNN is a k vector for each node saying how many of the neighbors of that node are from each population. So going back to our little mini example, what we do here is we define reference sets so the first um, sub list in that list is individual zeros nodes, individual ones nodes, individual two nodes. So we come up with the reference sets. We run genealogical nearest neighbors. Uh, we have the samples. All we need to do is what we're calculating it on the samples, and then um, and then the reference sets. And then we'll just print that out in a way that's easy to see. Um, and we see that for node zero the nearest neighbors are all from individual A. So what does that mean? Let's look at the tree. Here's node 0. Nearest neighbor is 1, right? The sort of sibling node is 1. That's also from individuals A. Second tree, also uh, individual A. Third tree, still individual A. So all of its neighbors are from that, that reference set. For, individual, for node 1, same thing. It's just going the other way. For node 2, you see that it has neighbors from both individual B and C. So what that's counting is not only the number of neighbors, but also the span of the tree on where you find those neighbors. So 40% of its uh, nearest neighbors for node 2 are from individual B. 60% are from node C. Let's do the same for the other nodes. All right, so intuitively, just think of genealogical nearest neighbors as saying, OK, what's the most recent common ancestor and what are the other daughter nodes? Another way to say that might be what are the sister or sibling nodes of, um, of every node. And that's your genealogical nearest neighbors. So in the preprint, we did this for the UK Biobank. 
and actually found really, really fine scale uh, population structure in the UK down to county and sub-county level. Um, and refer you to the preprint to see that. But let's just see what we get from our Vivax example. So we'll run this. In seven milliseconds, we come up with genealogical nearest neighbors of the Vivax example of our reference sets, which are the 15 populations, those countries of origin. Um, and we'll actually subset the reference sets because some of them only have one sample. So it ends up being, I think, about six reference sets. Um, we just do a little data wrangling for the output. We're going to z-score, normalize uh, the GNN proportion, and then hierarchically cluster. And this is the code to do that. And then what you get out is this. So we said we hierarchically clustered on the uh, rows. That's just to represent the data in a meaningful way. And you can look and see that genealogical nearest neighbors exactly recapitulates geography. Samples from West Thailand, they have a lot of siblings from West Thailand. That makes sense. But then they're most closely related to Vietnam and Cambodia next. Well, those are pretty close to Thailand. And then further is Malaysia. After Malaysia is Indonesia, and even furthest is Papua New Guinea. So if you know something about Southeast Asia, that's sort of the, uh, the, uh, the order there. So even with this very rough and ready approach, um, with a very small sample size, uh, GNNs show geographical, um, that sort of top level signal of the variation, which is geography. And as I said, you can go to the preprint and look at how that shows up in the UK Biobank at a much finer grained level. Is that dendrogram constructed from the similarity matrix kind of post hoc? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we take the, uh, the GNN proportions for each. We sort of like mean all of this nodes that fall into each population, do the z-score normalization, and then hierarchical cluster. So yeah. Um, so yeah, that concludes the, the primer bit. Hopefully you know a little bit about what a tree sequence is now and how you can use them. Um, I'll hand over to Jerome to, uh, to continue the talk and talk about some cool results. Uh, thanks, Wilder. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's really, really great to be here again. And uh, thanks to Wilder for superb introduction to tree sequences. OK, so I'm going to talk about the tree sequence data structure from a sort of higher level perspective. And I hope to convince you that this data structure could be a very important part of the sort of mega sample genomic revolution that's, that's coming towards us. Um, so the context I want to put this in is that today we're, we're collecting genomic variation data, data at an unprecedented ever increasing rate, right? In the, in the UK alone, the NHS is planning to sequence 5 million people over the next five years. And even in, just in the consumer DNA space, uh, people estimate that there's, I think, 24 million people have, have undergone consumer DNA testing at this point, and this is projected to grow to 100 million in the next two years. So we're, we have these data sets now, which are absolutely vast, and incredible scale, which would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. And although there are going to be you know, huge riches in these data sets. I think we're, I think there's a very real danger that we could end up in a situation where we can't actually analyze the data. There's so much data there that the methods we have are straight to breaking points and we're not able to interrogate them uh, as well as we might hope to. And I think one of the underlying reasons for this is that the, the methods that we have are really rooted in the era of kilo sample genomics. They're very firmly rooted in the methods that were developed, in particular from the Thousand Genomes Project. And to me, the, the, um, the fundamental abstraction that's uh, underlying killer sample genomics is the variant matrix. So the variant matrix is very, very simple. We have uh, a matrix which consists of rows for every variant site that's in your, in your sample. And each row consists of the observations for each of your end samples at that site. So it's very simple, very intuitive, very easy to grasp. And given that, the number of variant sites will usually be in the range of 1 million to 100 million for most of the species that we're interested in. Then 
you know, we're, we're looking at a pretty serious computational scaling problem. If number of samples is 10 million and your number of sites is 100 million, then you have an extraordinarily large matrix which is, is basically unworkable. But there's no reason that we have to encode data as a matrix. The very matrix is just an abstraction. We're entirely free to use a different abstraction if we want. And another abstraction which people have used uh, in, in biology for well, centuries really is, is the tree. So trees encode the ancestry of our sample. It's not just thinking about what data exists today. It thinks about what are the ancestor of our ancestors of um, some set of, say, um, species in this phylogeny here. What do, they, what do they look like? And so these phylogenies are, are central to, to many different aspects of biology. And there are many, many different ways of inferring uh, phylogenies. It's a very intensely studied problem. And there is a rich literature out there for you know, inferring these trees. And a really nice property of the trees is that if we know the trees, then we can encode the variation that we have today. We can encode our variation data by placing mutations on the tree in a very efficient way. So the, the data that we observe today is, is as a result of mutations that happened on the, the branches of the tree. And if we store these mutations, then we can losslessly encode the, the variation data uh, very efficiently. So specifically, every mutation requires only constant space to, um, to store, because all we need to know is which tree node it occurs over. And typically, we'll expect to have a very small number of mutations, nearly always one, maybe sometimes a few, and very, very occasionally many. But on average, we will expect there to be order, ones, order one space per site to encode the n observations that we have. So we've gone from order one, or sorry, order n space from storing a, a row in the variant matrix to order one, assuming that we know the, the tree. And I guess one of the reasons why we're not using trees to, as a computational tool in, in large scale genomics at the moment is because, unfortunately, nature isn't that simple. And we don't have a single tree which describes the ancestry of a sample across a chromosome. And this is because of recombination. So any time that you have um, non-clonal inheritance of genetic material from a parent to a child, then there's going to be parts of a child's genome which inherits ancestry from different parents. And this necessarily as a sort of logic, logical necessity means that you'll have different trees uh, across, the, across the gene. So yeah, when a child inherits different um, segments of ancestral material from a parent, then there will be different trees as you move across the genome. And as, as Wilder showed really clearly, when you have one of these breakpoints, this corresponds to a change in the tree. And this is encoded in this sequence of, of correlated trees as you move uh, across the genome. And it's this sequence of correlated trees, and specifically the, the encoding and the data structure that we have for, for working with this, that I'm very excited about, and I think can really help us to make the most of the, the mega sample sort of uh, data that's coming our way. So the, what we call it is the succinct tree sequence data structure, but we usually just call it a tree sequence. And it's a very, very simple and natural encoding of the trees that arise from recombination. And I'm gonna argue that this data structure has the potential to both dramatically improve our uh, processing uh, computational efficiency, but also provide new biological insights along the way. Uh, so talk outline is I'm gonna spend some time sort of reviewing the applications that we've used tree sequences for to date. And then I'm gonna take a look at what the sort of fundamental properties of the tree sequence data structure are that allow us to make these sort of large uh, leaps in, in computational performance. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time at the end um, talking about where I think things are gonna go uh, from over the next few years. Okay, so first section is uh, an overview of, of the results that we've obtained using tree sequences up to now. So I'm gonna start with Coalescence simulations, talk about forward time simulations, 
spend quite a bit of time talking about ancestry inference because this is, I guess, what most of you are interested in. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, preliminary, preliminary work I've been, I've been doing on uh, the Lee and Stevens uh, process. So the tree sequence data structure arose out of uh, the MS Prime coalescence simulator. And this is work that I, I did with Alison Etheridge and Gil McVean, and both of them have been very privileged to work with. And coalescence simulations, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, are a very useful part of the toolkit of uh, population genetics. It's a way of thinking about uh, the history of a sample in taking uh, a backwards in time view. And one of the big advantages of the coalescence, uh, particularly uh, when we don't have recombination, is that it's very, very efficient. So when we don't have recombination, simulating a history for a given gene is extremely efficient and has been used extensively in, in, in coalescent theory since the, the early 80s. But classically, the coalescent with recombination has been considered to be much too difficult a problem to, to solve or, or, or to run simulations at scale. So until very recently, it wasn't considered feasible to simulate more than, say, a thousand really quite short chromosome fragments. Anything else led to explosions in, in, in computational time and, and space. But the, uh, the tree sequence data structure in MS Prime has, has completely changed this narrative. We now can simulate uh, tens of millions of, of whole chromosomes pretty, um, pretty routinely. So we've literally changed simulation times from months to, to minutes or even seconds. Uh, and so this is, this is a really big uh, leap forward in what we could do with uh, simulations. And these very large sample sizes aren't, you know, it's just not just because we can do it, we do it because this is absolutely necessary where we need to perform simulations of these large sample sizes so that we can create expectations for what's going to happen with the data that we have. So my favorite, um, my favorite example of, of MS Prime being put to good use is from your very own superstar, Alicia Martin from here in the Broad. And uh, as part of a study looking at the, the biases introduced in GWAS by having very Eurocentric reference panels, she performed um, some simulations which simulated polygenic risk scores on top of 600,000 samples of human chromosome 20. And this, this simulation just wouldn't have been possible without, without MS Prime, without being able to work with very large sample sizes. So this is you know, important work that's improving our understanding of the, the fundamental methods that we're using to understand medicine is being impacted by having simulations that we can, you know, we can trust. So coalescent simulations are, are very useful, um, but they do make some really quite strong assumptions about the model that you're simulating. And, so, and specifically, we really can't have any forms of selection in the, in the past of your sample if the, the coalescent is going to be a good model for, um, for your, your sample. So coalescent simulations are, are very, very efficient, but they're, um, they're not very flexible. Forward time simulators are the opposite. They're extremely flexible. You can basically simulate anything you want, but classically, they're very, very slow. Um, and forward simulators are slow because they literally start with you know, a population of n individuals, and they simulate these n individuals generation by generation by generation until you've reached some sort of uh, equilibrium. And the whole point of, of running simulations is to obtain some data. And if we're to get data that is realistic, then we need to have uh, quite a few neutral mutations in along with whatever selected mutations we're, we're simulating in our forward simulation. And you know, if this is going to be whole genomes, then this is going to be millions of neutral mutations. And the thing is that these neutral mutations, by definition, don't affect the fitness of any of the individuals. So really is a waste to be carrying around all of these millions of neutral mutations when they don't actually affect the simulation in, in any way. And you, you're just bringing them along so that you'll have some realistic variation at the end 
So along with my uh, excellent group, group of collaborators here, uh, in particular Peter Ralph and, and Kevin Thornton, we came up with a way of using the tree sequence data structure to remove this very heavy cost of tracking neutron mutations. And basically the idea is that we record, uh, as we go through the, the generations, we record exactly, for every individual, exactly who they inherited which piece of, of genome from. And so this is you know, a huge amount of information and clearly we've run out of memory very quickly. But the secret sauce that, that makes this work is a sort of garbage collection algorithm that we run uh, periodically, which we call simplification, that removes all of the ancestry that's unnecessary so that we only retain what's needed to explain the ancestry of the extant population. And the upshot of this is that um, simulations are now at least hundreds of times faster, and we can do simulations that just weren't possible before. Uh, so there's two, two papers uh, came out last year about this. Uh, one is the sort of underlying method and the, the algorithms that we use to, to, make, to make it work. And the other is the sort of concrete implementation of this method in the popular SLIM, um, SLIM software. And there's some really nice examples of doing interesting things with simulations in this paper as well. And this is, this is quite an important point for me, is that it's not just about making the simulations faster, it's about giving us a whole new level of flexibility and um, precision about what we can simulate. And, and a, an important point is that it gives us much deeper analysis of the results. So if you, if you run a forward time simulation and you just get you know, n um, sequences at the end of it, then you don't have an awful lot of information about the historical processes that you know, generated this data. Whereas if you have the trees, you have the exact history of everything that happens in the history of your sample, and you can do very, very precise um, analyses of what were the important parts of this simulation which led to the, the patterns of variation that you see at the, at the end. Um, so there are two different simulation engines that, that implement this uh, tree sequence recording. Uh, there's a forward PP engine from um, Kevin Thornton, and Slim Simulator, as I mentioned, uh, is from Ben Haller. And these use the, the TS kit C and Python libraries to, um, to output tree sequences. And we can load tree sequences simulated from either of those into MS Prime and then put neutral mutations off of those. So we've got really excellent in interoperability between three completely different software packages here, which is something we absolutely can't take for granted in, in bioinformatics. And final thing I'm going to say about uh, forward simulations is that because we're uh, simulating trees now, we can split up the process of, of, of running our simulations. We can simulate, for example, the, the recent past using some complicated, complicated model of selection, arbitrary demographies for, say, a thousand generations in the past. And then we can then switch over to simulating the, the deep ancient history using the, the coalescent process, which is, which, is quite, um, which is quite a good model for, for the ancient history of, of populations. So this sort of level of, of finesse and precision of being able to you know, do partial simulations in one package and, and complete the simulations in another it really couldn't be done before. Um, so the third application uh, I want to talk about is ancestry inference. Um, this is something that Wilder talked about it earlier. And this is work that I did with my colleagues at the Big Data Institute uh, in Oxford. And before I start uh, talking about what we did, I just want to review the reasons for why we might want to do it. And so the first reason that we want to infer ancestry is that it really is of fundamental biological interest. People have been researching ancestral recombination graphs uh, for around two decades. And I hate to use such uh, a cliche phrase, but it has been seen as, as very much a holy grail sort of goal to be able to infer a full ancestral recombination graph from data. Because if we know this history, then this greatly simplifies 
much of the downstream evolutionary analysis that we want to do. So things like detecting selection, integration events, historical population structure, all of these things become, if not trivial, then much, much easier to do conditioned on having the trees. Um, so this is an excellent reason for wanting to, to infer ancestry, but another reason, which is sort of close to my own heart, is that we can make, potentially make huge computational gains in um, evolutionary computation by using this data structure. So as we'll see a bit later, we can potentially store very, very large data sets uh, compactly using tree sequence. And we also get very, very fast algorithms for processing the data. So we've got two compelling reasons for wanting to infer ancestry, either of which would be, would be sufficient. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into any detail really on the, how the in inference algorithm works. Um, but it basically just consists of two steps. So the first step is that we think about, we, we generate some putative um, ancestral haplotypes. So we use some reasoning about how the patterns of extant variation uh, exist around, around sites where mutations occur. And we use this to generate ancestral haplotypes. What was the haplotypic background on which each site arose? And then given those putative ancestor sequences, we find how they relate to each other using uh, a modified Lee and Stevens process. And then once we know how the ancestors relate to each other, we can see then how the samples relate to the ancestors. And these copying paths basically define the, um, the tree sequence. So if you're interested in, um, in more details about this, then I can refer you to our modestly titled um, preprint here. So what I, what I do want to do is just give you a sense of how this sort of sits with the, the state of the art. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, if you have an admix sample, then will this do local ancestry inference, or are you assuming everybody comes from a homogeneous population? It's pretty much model free. Um, we're not making any sort of assumptions about the, the underlying population models and so on. So we would hope that it will, it will pick out these, these signals. That they, these signals will be in the trees. It can output not just one number for ancestry, but actually local ancestry. Well, that would need to be sort of post-processed afterwards, so given, given the trees. So there's actually someone who's working on this as part of her PhD in, in Melbourne, is given, given a tree sequence which you know has uh, some admixture, can you process the trees in such a way that you can um, define these local ancestry tracks? Uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting, interesting problem. And, and so just to follow up, when you're talking about tool comparison, yeah. what's the output that you're actually comparing? Or like, is there some model you have in mind? So that's another very good question. Um, it's a difficult thing, and this is actually part of what Jan spent an awful lot of time doing, was taking the various tools and making the output comparable. And so ultimately, what we want, what we're doing is, you can you can look at the output of any of these tools as a set of um, a set of marginal trees. So there's a tree defined at every base pair position, basically. And what we ended up doing was taking the output and sort of wrangling it so that it output these marginal trees, and then we compare the marginal trees to each other. Um, all right, go. Um, so we want to compare. Uh, we compare our method with, with two other tools. We, we compared with quite a few others in the paper, um, but I just want to compare with these two because they represent the state of the art in two different dimensions. So Argweaver is the state of the art in terms of accuracy. It's by far the most accurate um, ARG inference method out there. And FastArg is then an unpublished method from Hung Lee, but I'm using it here because it's by far the fastest available ARG inference method. So the first thing we want to know is, well, is, you know, is what we're inferring close to the truth? Are we inferring something that's real or is, it, or is it garbage? And the way we do that is by looking at these output trees and comparing them to an original truth. So we simulate some trees using uh, either MS Prime or Slim, 
and we output some sequences. The sequences get input into the, the various tools, and then the tools output marginal trees. We compare these output marginal trees with the original truth, and we use a tree distance metric to tell us how close or far away they are from each other. So the y-axis here is uh, the tree distance, and the closer this is to zero, the closer the trees are to the original truth. And on the x-axis, then, we have increasing mutation rate. So we, <clears throat> we vary the mutation rate from very low to, to quite high, and as we throw more and more mutations down on the, the trees, what we should see, because they're infinite size mutations, is that there's more and more information about the branches, and our methods should tend towards a tree distance of zero. And this is, this is what we're seeing from all the different methods. And so basically, the, the take home message here is that we're, um, so TS and FAR is, is basically as accurate as Argweaver, indeed a little bit more accurate in the, the low, low mutation rate regime. And when we have no error, and then when we have a little bit of genotyping error, which has been sort of sprinkled on afterwards, there, you know, TSNFR is a little bit less accurate than ArgWeaver, but it's not catastrophically so. Uh, fast Arg is, is quite a bit less accurate than the, the other two. And the second thing that we want to know is, is how long does it take to, to run these inferences? And basically, Fast Arg and TSNFR are in a completely different timescale to, to um, ArgWeaver. So we've had to split this um, y-axis here because there's such a vast difference in the, the timescales. So, and we're also having to run on absolutely tiny data sets because ArgWeaver takes so long. Um, so basically ArgWeaver, you can't run it on more than say 20, 20 samples on less than say a megabyte <coughs> of, of data. And when we scale this up to something more like uh, modern data set sizes, then we see that um, TSNFAR is, is much, much faster than, than FASTA. And in particular, when we increase the, the sample size here and, and keeping the sequence length fixed at, a, at five megabases, we see that the, the growth in um, CPU time is basically linear. So we're basically scaling linearly with CPU time in terms of sample size, which is a really, really important property. Uh, so we did. We applied, um, we applied TSNFER to three different data sets. We applied it to uh, Simon's Genome Diversity Project, 1000 Genomes Data, and UK Biobank. And I'm not going to go into the details of what we did with those data sets, but I do want to show you UK Biobank. Um, a, because the fact that we could do it at all is, is pretty astonishing. Um, being able to estimate an ARG for a million samples over a whole chromosome a, would have been a ludicrous pipe dream a few years ago. And now we can do it in two days on a, a decent server with, with a really quite reasonable amount of RAM. Uh, so the, the file that we output, the, the trees file, is, is not remarkably small. It's two gigabytes, which is a bit bigger than the original bgen file. But what I do want to convince you is that this file contains real biological signal. This, this isn't just some... Yes. Um, you, this is the first time, I think, that you've talked about diploid samples. And yes. that, you must be implicitly you're doing phasing then. Yes, we are assuming phase data. And we're assuming oh. phase data and we're assuming that we know ancestral states. Okay. Um, uh, they're the two big assumptions. Uh, well, you can't be, right. well, I mean, yeah. you, you can assume that, but I mean, you, okay, I mean, you're still building trees from all, all the, I mean, you have actual real data, so you're yeah. building trees that, have a certain assumption of implicit, but you're still mapping the data. <coughs> and I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, so you have a, you have a pre-phasing step already. We don't do the phasing. The phasing is phase data is taken as input, okay. and yeah. ancestral state calls are taken as input as well. Okay. Um, Can you go into a little more detail on the second point of the previous slide as well? Because yeah, so now you have sparse data instead of sequence data. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Okay, so this was, this was problematic. Um, we have our, our method for, for generating ancestors, you know, that's the first step of the process, is to generate some ancestor, ancestor sequences and then see how they relate to each other using Lee and Stevens' process. It turns out that this didn't work very well when we had sparse SNP data because basically 
we've only got 16,000 sites on a quite a big chromosome, and there may be several tree changes in between these sites. So a lot of the signals that we were picking up um, with more dense data just didn't occur. And so we, we resolved this with uh, a method which actually infers ancestral sequences based on recombination signals. So given, if, if we see shared recombination breakpoints between you know, two ancestors or, or two paths follow exactly the same recombination breakpoint, then this is strong evidence to suggest <clears throat> that there existed an ancestor that consisted, that had this you know, exact breakpoint in it. So we used that in a sort of iterative process and we were able to come up with this, this tree sequence which I think does contain quite a lot of, lot of biological information in it. Um, so Wilder explained the GNN statistic uh, really well earlier, uh, so I'm not gonna go into it now, but it's, it's basically giving us a measure of the relatedness of, of our samples in, a, in, particular, in particular sets. And we applied it to the UK Biobank data, and just to say that computing GNN is very, very efficient, so we can do this in about five minutes uh, on a fairly decent server. So we can you know, very quickly um, slice the data in, in all sorts of different ways to see how structure uh, arises in, in different ways. So once we've done this step of estimating the tree sequence, doing computations on it afterwards uh, is very, very fast. Um, so I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on, on this slide, because um, you could spend an hour talking about it itself, but basically I just wanna show you that we're picking out you know, real population structure here. So on the, every row of this is a, a region in the, uh, in the UK. So this is uh, West Wales here, and that's represented by the uh, row here. And what it's saying is that individuals from West Wales are most likely to have relatives in West Wales. And after West Wales, they're most likely to have relatives in, in East Wales. And we took this, so this GNN matrix then, we, we took that, we ran hierarchical clustering on it, and this produced this uh, dendrogram and an ordering of the rows here. And it's kind of hard to see here, but it's pulling out really interesting population structure in the UK. So the, the most obvious thing is that it's, it's showing this like strong north-south divide um, where Scotland, Northern Ireland, and the north of England all cluster together first before Wales and the south of England. And this, this is the area around London here, which is sort of a big, uh, big mess, really. Uh, but there's very strong population structure in other parts of England, and we're, we're sort of digging into this at the moment. So Shaima has been working on how we're gonna show this information in a, in a really nice way on the map. So we're, we'll hopefully have some nice figures out of that pretty soon. Um, sure. Um, so in addition to an hour-long talk on that, I'd, I'd be interested in an hour-long talk on the inference, because I feel like the two years since you were here last, yeah. you had this problem, which is you had a data structure that worked really well when you simulated through it, but how do you actually use it in practice? And would you agree there are two different aspects? One is a very like objective question, which is does storing the data this way losslessly give us faster sort of storage and compute? Mm -hmm. And then the other is, are you actually getting the real history uh, and can you make differences from the tree that you find? Mm. And, and so can you tell us a little bit about sort of what the last couple of years have been like trying to bridge from something that works in simulation to something that works on real data? Do you feel like you've gotten to the final solution? Do you feel like this is still very heuristic but effective for the first task, but maybe not the second as much as you'd like? Where are we? It's a work in progress. It is most definitely not finished. Um, we can absolutely, definitely improve the inference in both dimensions, I think. So I think as, as things are refined, there will be methods that are better for compressing the data and producing um, compressed information, which is really good for just doing um, processing. And on the other hand, there are gonna be methods which are probably more expensive, but better at pulling out the real history. Um, so I th to me, I see it as a first step. This is the first step which has made it possible to run at this scale. And we've made a bunch of approximations on the way. And now we can sort of 
work on the individual problems and, and improve those. So that's the, that's the plan, basically. Awesome. Uh, yeah. um, okay, so the inference algorithm is non-parametric and deterministic. Um, it, you know, as I say, it makes a whole bunch of approximations, but all these approximations can be relaxed in turn and we can explore how to, how to fix that. But even at the moment, accuracy is about as good as the state of the art, but it's about six orders of magnitude faster. Um, and the output tree sequences are rich in biological signal. I hope I've convinced you with the UK Biobank example that there is real biology coming through here. This, this isn't just an arbitrary compression of data. Um, so pretty briefly, I'm gonna talk about what I've been working on for the last um, six months or so. And this sort of evolved out of TS Infer. Um, so one of the things we're doing in TS Infer, which is an approximation, is we're using quite a limited version of the Lee and Stevens model. So we can, um, we can only have uh, binary mutations and we can't have back mutations and various things. So I want, to, I want to relax these assumptions in a general way so that we can apply Lee and Stevens uh, to all the other um, to all the other applications in uh, modern large-scale genomics. So quickly, the Lee and Stevens is an approximation of the coalescence, and it gives us a pretty nice, efficient way of thinking about how the um, forces of recombination and mutation combine to produce um, extant haplotypes. Um, so Lee and Stevens supposes that we've got a, a reference panel of haplotypes and a query haplotype that has sort of come in from, from the outside uh, can be seen as an imperfect mosaic of the, the haplotypes in that reference panel. And so specifically what I've been working on is computing the, the forward matrix, which is one of the <coughs> fundamental operations in, um, it's one of the fundamental operations in, in HMMs. And in particular, it's used a lot for present day imputation methods. So computing the, the forward matrix costs order n times m time, as we saw earlier, N and M are big, so this, this is too much. Um, and the, the basis of the, the algorithm I've been working on is um, a property of the Lee and Stevens model that I think hasn't really been uh, noted before, is that as you, when you compute the forward matrix, there are actually not that many distinct probability values within the matrix itself. So down here, I've, I've computed the, the forward matrix for a simulated data set, and I've output the number of distinct probabilities at each site under um, different numbers of decimal places of precision. And we can see that this number of distinct values follows a random walk across the, um, across the, the sites, and the number of distinct values is really quite small. So for um, six decimal places here, it's about 20. And on the right-hand side then, or sorry, the left, uh, I've done this for the, I've taken the expectation of this random walk um, for varying sizes of n. So as we get larger and larger reference panels, we don't, what we see is that the, um, the number of distinct values in the uh, forward matrix actually approaches a, a maximum and for arbitrarily large n, we don't expect there to be very, we don't expect the number of distinct values to, to grow any further. So I haven't been able to um, fully formalize this. Um, so my sort of lack of maths is letting me down here a bit, but I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a real property of the, the Lee and Stevens model. And- well, It should be possible to prove something like this analytically. It definitely is. I mean, you know, you would, so you only, your results, they're all empirical, right? Yeah. Um, That's a challenge problem. Yeah, so if anyone wants to help me then. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the upshot is that it works, basically. For, for simulated data, we get this beautiful log, log time uh, growth in the, the time it takes to run, to, to compute the forward matrix. Um, so just for uh, reference, I've plotted, you know, to, to make sure that the, the constants that we're reporting are, are, are reasonable. I've reported the time here that um, uh, Rosen and Payton had for their method, which is from this, um, this recent uh, bioarchive preprint, and they, their growth of order n to the point n.35 
Anyway, this this is very preliminary, and I'm really just showing this to. I don't want to comment. I, it's not obvious to me why having just a limited number of values uh, reduces the work. You you sort of skip that bit. Because they cluster on the tree, and then you can oh. you can just look at the tree nodes. The question is, and that's a very good question, um, is why does this actually help us? Why does it help that there are a limited number of values in the matrix? And basically it doesn't if you're, if you're just computing the matrix, but it turns out that these values cluster very well on the trees, and then all you need to remember is where the values sit on the tree, and then compute with that. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit tricky, but it works extremely well. For simulated data, anyway. Um, so it's it's a bit it's a bit preliminary. I would have liked to have this working better at this point, but um, it does work superbly on simulated data. I'm working on it for working on on real data, and I think it has some pretty exciting applications for for the Lee and Stevens model in in things like um, in things like imputation. Because now that we're doing it on trees. We, we don't have to just match to the extant samples, the, the samples that are just in the reference panel. We can match to the ancestors as well, and that might be a much more appropriate um, way to do it. <clears throat> okay, so we've made these sort of multi-order of magnitude performance gains in a, a few different applications. And I want to spend a little bit of time here just examining why we're able to do this. What are the fundamental properties of this data structure that let us make these um, performance gains? So the, the first fundamental property is that the file size is determined by the number of recombinations. So clearly, the first tree along the sequence requires order n space. If we have n samples, then the tree needs n space to, to store. And then subsequent trees, which are the result of recombination events, um, structurally are, are the result of subtree pruning and regraft. And we'll show that this, this particular um, structure uh, will guarantee that the difference between these trees is quite small. I just want to note that this, this isn't tied to the coalescent model. This is a consequence of the basic properties of, of inheritance. So this isn't driven by the, the coalescent per se. Any any um, population model will produce trees with this uh, property. So I want to talk you through uh, a quick example of what it looks like when we move from one tree to the next, and this will help build an intuition for why it's very efficient to do this. So we start at this initial tree, and we're going to remove some edges first. So we remove this edge, which has been colored red between 35 and 38, and we remove uh, three more Okay, so we remove three more edges, and we're left with a bunch of disconnected subtrees. And then once we've done removing all the edges that, uh, that go out, we start inserting new edges. So we insert a new edge between 12 and 32, and we keep inserting edges until we've reached, we've completed the, the next tree. So we've transformed a tree into its successor with this sequence of eight very, very simple operations. And we proved that this is true in general. So there's, we're guaranteed that at most four edges need to be inserted and removed per tree transition. And therefore, the time required to transition between trees is constant. And then as another consequence of this, if we have n samples and we have a, a scaled recombination rate of rho, then we know that the total file size must be n plus rho log n. So because rho log n is the number of recombinations, every recombination costs constant space. Therefore, the total size is n plus rho log n. And then if we think about uh, the sites, well, we know every site costs constant space. So therefore, the overall, um, the overall size is n plus rho log n plus m, rho log n again is your number of recombinations. So the file size is fundamentally driven by the number of recombinations, and there are no multiplicative, no multiplicative terms in this, uh, in this equation. And, yep. 
Uh, so why is it that you have order log and recombination events? This is a result from coalescent theory. Um, it's basically coming down to the lengths of branches. So coalescent recombination events happen on branches of trees, and the maths tells us that we expect there to be um, log n of these. So basically, as you, as you add more and more samples, the, the branches, the extra branches that you're adding are getting shorter and shorter, and getting shorter and shorter logarithmically. Yeah. And the last one, that might not be constant space, is that a site is recorded as a mutation somewhere along the tree, on yeah. the tree branch somewhere one time. Exactly, yeah. So you're just recording the position of the site, the, the node that it occurs over, and the change in state. And you maintain that in real data. You never, you never have to do that twice or anything. Just... Well, we make that requirement at the moment, but you can you don't have to have one mutation per site. You can have an arbitrary number. It's not, it's not a, a requirement of the format. So you but have you totally have multi-site leaks. But on average, you expect there to be one. Right? There aren't that many sites where we've got complicated mutation patterns. Uh, so the upshot of this is that we can store, um, we can store data very, very, very compactly. Uh, so I've done some simulations here where we simulate up to 10 million uh, 100 megabase chromosomes, and we uh, show the storage space required to, to store the files, and we extrapolate this out to 10 billion, 10 billion chromosomes. So we're thinking about what would the file look like if we tried to store variation data for every human alive, basically. And if you wanted to do this with a VCF file, it would be something like 24 petabytes. And G-zipping helps an awful lot. It would be something like 200 terabytes if you, if you G-zip the data. But if you use the, the trees file, um, so the, the, the simulated tree sequence, this would only be about a terabyte. So we're looking at all of the, all the variation data for 10 billion, um, 10 billion chromosomes. You can basically store it on your laptop. And I've also, um, shown here uh, what we call the minimized trees because this file format is, is basically optimized for speed at the moment. We've made no effort at all to make it small. And so if we do a bit of um, throwing away of data and, um, and compressing of arrays, then we can bring this down to something that's about tenfold smaller. So we can exactly store all of the, the, the data in only about 75 gigabytes. Excellent question. So this bit is driven by the, the row log n, right? And then it becomes dominated by the n. So it's an additive, it's n plus row log n. Um, so n is, n is relatively small here and row log n is dominating, but then n becomes larger than row log n. So basically the, this, the file size is dominated by the first tree. Uh, the second uh, sort of fundamental uh, algorithmic property that I want to go through quickly is that we can efficiently maintain subtree summaries. And this is, really is the basis of all the efficient algorithms that we've, that we've done so far. Uh, so suppose we want to count the samples under, in the tree that, have, um, that are from this blue subset. So you can't really see the blue probably. But these are particular nodes that we're interested in. So suppose these are these ones are our cases and the zeros are controls, right? We want to count how many nodes underneath every node are from these different sets. And so the way we do it is, is very, very simple, right? The, for the leaf nodes, it's one if you're in the blue set. And then for any internal nodes, your count is just the sum of your children. So it's totally standard tree, tree logic. And what we want to do then is maintain this summary as we move from tree to tree. So as we change it to the next tree, we want to make sure that this summary is kept accurate. And it's very straightforward to do this. So all we have to do is to make sure that as we remove edges, we maintain the, the property in the disconnected subtree. So in this disconnected subtree, we correctly, um, we correctly count the nodes that are underneath every, every tree. And so we keep doing that. We keep making sure that our um, counts are correct, 
until we've removed all the edges. And then we start adding in the new edges for the, the next tree. And we do the same thing. We, we make sure that the, the node counts are correct. And so this is, this is the interesting one here. So we've gone from um, this disconnected subtree is going to be connected to the main tree here. And the count at the root is currently three because this is disconnected. When we connect it up to the, the main tree, then we propagate this two all the way up to the root. And then by doing that, we're guaranteed that the counts are correct at every, at every point. And so the upshot of it is that we can maintain these tree summaries in order tree height time, right? So every time we add or remove an edge, in worst case, we have to, tra we have to traverse up to the top of the tree, um, propagating these losses and gains. And we know that trees are balanced nearly always. So the cost of this operation is therefore log n. Um, <clears throat> so we can maintain these counts very, very efficiently. Uh, so this is just a, a really simple example of what you could do, but all sorts of computations can be cast in this sort of framework of thinking about trees and subtrees. This is basically dynamic programming. Okay, so I want to spend the last five minutes just talking about where we are and where we're where I hope to go with this. Um, so as I kind of mentioned earlier, the we definitely want to improve inference. Um, we've the trees in fur the trees in fur by TS and fur are, are not perfect. We can definitely do better, and there are clear ways in which we can make the algorithm better. Um, in particular, the new Lee and Stevens method will make TS and Fair much more um, much more flexible. Um, we're also well. Wilder's working on putting node times into the the trees, which will make them really very useful for biological applications like detecting selection and so on. And there are also lots and lots of very exciting applications that we can do with trees. So I really encourage you to look at this um, preprint from uh, Simon Meyer's lab, where they've had another a different method for estimating genome wide genealogies but they've really focused on the applications of this to, to biology and there's some really amazing um, results in there. Um, another thing we want to know is, well, why is compression not brilliant at the moment? And so sort of as a matter of faith, and I think it's actually probably a reasonably well-based faith, that you know these trees really do exist, right? The, as a matter of logical necessity, there must be trees which describe the ancestry of our samples, and they must follow this pattern of, of recombination and, um, and, and common ancestry. And if we knew the trees, these would be superb for compressing the data. And I think what's hurting us at the moment is that there's an awful lot of error in the data. Um, there are many different ways of, of having errors, and they all add up to, to make things difficult. But as, as we collect more data and as our methods at all of these different steps improve, then we expect our data to improve, right? We're, why are we collecting so much data if we don't expect our knowledge to, to get better? And the inference algorithm ex itself can definitely be improved. So we have a, a modular architecture which will, means that we can attack different bits of it independently. Um, Software is really important, so all of the software that I'm talking about is well-engineered and it's open source in the TS kit, C, and Python libraries. So all of the basic building blocks are in there and they can be accessed really easily and efficiently. And we have a GitHub community, which is, which is growing steadily. And so if you're interested in any of this, please check us out and we can uh, find things to, to work on. And so my final word here is that I believe that tree sequences could be a really powerful part of our ways of tackling um, or using mega sample data. And I think that if we try to just apply existing technologies to mega sample data, then we're not going to get the best out of it. We can't just throw GPUs at this problem and expect to get the best out of our data. We need specialized methods, and they need to be guided by, by theory. And I think the, the succinct tree sequence data structure really elegantly combines these um, requirements of computational efficiency and biological richness. So I think there is this potential virtuous cycle here. So 
if we understand the evolutionary forces that shaped our data better, then we can store and process it more efficiently. And then by having more efficient algorithms to interrogate the data, we can gain new insights into these same evolutionary forces and we can repeat this cycle. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, there's more information uh, about the various parts of the talk I've talked about. Uh, some links to, to GitHub here if you're interested. Uh, I'm very happy to take any more questions and look forward to discussing all this with you.